Good evening. We have the luxury of enjoying the brand new Forum Furniture, its inaugural rollout. We are blessed. Yeah, blessed. It's very, <laughs> very God's comfortable. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all for joining me this evening. My name is Nico Mealy. I'm director of the Shorenstein Center here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I have with me to my left Sally Quinn is an author and a journalist formerly of the Washington Post. Her most recent book just out is Finding Magic, a Spiritual Memoir. Next to her is the Reverend Jonathan Walton, who is the Plumer Professor of Christian Morals and Pusey Minister in the Memorial Church here on campus. Many of you may have seen him in Memorial Church, and he's also a Professor of Religion and Society at the Harvard Divinity School. And finally, we have E.J. Dion Jr., who is an opinion writer with the Washington Post, and for one semester only on the faculty uh, jointly between the Divinity School, FAS, and the Kennedy School. And it's really a delight to have all three of these people here to join us this evening. So uh, next week we have uh, uh, Day of the Dead and the Feast of All Souls. And I guess you could call it a moment of reflection about uh, who we are and where we're going. I, I, preparing for tonight, was thinking about my own journey, my own faith journey, and I was raised Catholic, and I feel like the works of mercy were seared into my soul to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to harbor the harborless, to visit the sick, sick to ransom the captive, and to bury the dead. But we're here tonight to talk about something very far from the works of mercy, which is the prosperity gospel and its impact on American politics, the way it's helped to shape the moment we've arrived at and the presidency of Donald Trump. To start there, I just thought I'd ask, uh, Jonathan, you've talked about, written about the prosperity gospel and its history in, in the United States. What, what is it? How would, you, how would you describe the prosperity gospel? Well, I think there's two ways to describe the prosperity gospel, but I just want to begin by saying thank you for, for inviting me here and allowing me to be a part of this uh, panel. I feel like a grasshopper in my own sight sitting beside or in between these two towering figures. So uh, please, I'm asking the Lord to have grace on me right now. <laughs> Um, don't believe any of that. <laughs> I have heard him preach. <laughs> but, um, but so thank you again. Uh, but I think there's two ways to define the prosperity gospel. Uh, I think there is a more conservative uh, way to define it, and that is as a self-sustained, independent movement that grew out of the kind of post-World War context, um, the neo-charismatic revivalist healing revival movement. It's also known um, commonly as the word of faith movement or the faith movement. And largely it's, it hinges upon the principles of sowing and reaping, right? Spiritually sowing uh, material goods and then reaping in return, um, as well as positive confession based upon uh, the scripture, uh, as a person thinketh, as a man thinketh, so is he. And so it's this kind of combination of positive thinking coupled with faith in sowing and reaping with a third principle of viewing the Bible as a contract between believers and God, where uh, God wants to unleash uh, infinite uh, wealth and health to all of those who have enough faith. So that's the word of faith movement, but really I think if we look at the cultural air of American society, even dating back to the 18th century, you see some variant of this uh, prosperity gospel in American Protestantism. I mean, we're talking about a kind of unbridled uh, sense of aspiration and accumulation um, that has, that whether we're talking about uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin and Poor Richard's Almanac uh, and his great sayings and proverbs such as, uh, uh, hunger looks in the working man's house, but he dare not enter or uh, that 
proverb that he provided in Poor Richard's Almanac, uh, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, and that's become such a staple of American religion that I think the last poll, it was like 80% of Americans think that that's a scripture verse. Uh, and it's nowhere printed in the Bible. Or whether we're talking about moving forward uh, to Norman Vincent Peale and the power of positive thinking, or even before that, and I'll maybe can talk about this a little bit later, people like John Wanamaker, the great pre Presbyterian uh, businessman and department store owner that brought in a pipe organ and stained glass windows and really helped American society move from an ethic of thrift and sobriety to a Protestant ethic of consumerism and consumption, blessing our purchasing power. And so all of these things really kind of constitute uh, this sense of God wants us to bless, be blessed and prosper. God wants us to be rich. God wants us to uh, be wealthy. God wants us to be uh, healthy in body. God wants us uh, to enjoy the blessings and the bounty of king in the kingdom. As the great Reverend Ike used to put it, uh, God doesn't want me to have my, uh, uh, my pie in the sky by and by. He wants me to have it right now with a cherry on top. <laughs> and, and would you say, is, is that mostly been outside of mainstream denominations? Or what is its relationship, what's its in the, in the religious landscape? Well, I think, I think that's this kind of bigger definition of the prosperity gospel that I was talking about. I think that it's kind of easy uh, for us to identify particular communities, and these communities tend to be Pentecostal, uh, they tend to be communities of color, they tend to be, at least in the literature, whether this is true or not, impoverished community. And that's a kind of compens compensatory view of religion that many of us scholars have. And I am one to say that it tends to be somewhat of a supercilious view, a condescending view, where we think that it's only people of color and poor people that have these sorts of aspirations. Uh, I can tell a brief story about this. I was giving a lecture at Princeton University, um, and I was talking about the prosperity gospel, the word of faith movement, and there was a gentleman who was at, in attendance at the lecture who's a regular congregant at the Memorial Church. Really wonderful guy, very generous. Um, and he stood up and he asked a question. He said, uh, this, all this talk about new buildings and the fancy stuff, uh, he said, what in the world does this have to do with God? Why would these people go for this? And my immediate response became, you mean like a congregation that would install a $5 million organ? I'm talking about the Memorial Church. <laughs> and so, again, I think it's, it's a matter of perspective of how we look at it and who we feel deserves what. Huh. Sally, in your years reporting on faith in American life and in American politics, uh, how, how have you seen the rise of the prosperity gospel and and, and how do you contextualize it with Trump? What is, what is, is this, you know, he- you, you just said something when you talked about the cherry on top. I, th I think that the one thing that Trump has said that represents the prosperity gospel more than anything is when he said, somebody had said, well, you don't, you know, you only have really rich people in your cabinet. And he said, but I only want rich people in my cabinet. You remember when he said that? I don't want poor people in my cabinet. Mm -hmm. Well, what he didn't say was because they have not been blessed by God. And the rich people have, and I want these people who've been blessed by God. Um, so I started On Faith, uh, a religion website, 11 years ago. And um, it, that was the prosperity gospel then was very, very low rent and very suspect. And, and, and even, um, I mean, Russell Moore will talk about Paula White, who gave the invocation at President Trump's um, inauguration as a charlatan. And she is the queen of, um, she's the queen of prosperity gospel, and she is Trump's spiritual advisor. She's a televangelist and, um, and very rich. Um, and so when, when I started this re website, uh, people just, laughed at um, the prosperity gospel people, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, 
and they were the, the wrong side of the tracks. They were the poor hillbilly cousins. They were the people you were embarrassed by. They were lower in, in people's, uh, in terms of what the evangelicals thought. The evangelicals um, believed that they were well-read and they were smarter and they were more uh, socially acceptable and that these people were, an and then they, they despised the prosperity gospel people and, and then they also couldn't stand the Pentecostals who thought, they thought were embarrassing too because they were speaking in tongues and barking and waving their arms and all that. They just didn't want to be associated with them. And so, I mean, the, the evangelicals had uh, colleges. They had Wheaton College and um, the Pentecostals had television. And that's how they started reaching people. And so over the years, the prosperity people have begun to sort of take a hold, but they never did, they never did get the respect of the evangelicals. And I don't think they still have that. I don't think they have the respect of the evangelicals. But what I watched happen as Trump started coming into um, into power, I mean, when he started running for president, and he had Paula White by his side, who was a spiritual advisor, and, and Paula White basically has gone out and said, you know, God wants you to be rich, and essentially saying that there's something wrong with you if you're not rich, um, that, you know, that all good things come to those who work for them and, and you, you know you have to go out and you do it yourself and really looking down on the poor in some way um, and which divided them from the from the uh, from the evangelicals but then Trump once he had watched her you know you mentioned Norman Vincent Peale I mean he, who wrote the power of positive thinking and when he wrote that book um, he, he transformed the Trump family, went to his church, Trump married, I mean, Norman Vincent Peale married Trump uh, when he, for his first wedding. And it's always been this power of positive thinking. And so when he started running, and he brought Paula White in and started advising him and guiding him, it was all about God wants you to do this. And they love Trump because he doesn't, give up. I mean, they keep thinking, you know, you have to, you remember when Ben Carson went to Chicago, I think, and he said something about, well, you know, poor people, if they just need to work harder or something like that. Well, I think that's, this is the whole attitude. Trump just kept on going and he'd get bankrupt and he'd pull himself back up and he just keeps doing it. And so you see the, the seeds of that and particularly in what he, you, when I look at him and he says, the crowds in my inauguration were bigger than any crowds you've ever seen. And more recently, I have accomplished more than any president in the history of the country. And I have done the bigger and the better and everything else. What I, the prosperity gospel teaches you to think positively and like if you're in a wheelchair, you go and you say, I'm going to be healed. And even if you can't get out of the wheelchair, um, there, because there, somehow there's something wrong with you if you're not healed. And so you have to keep telling yourself that you are blessed, that God wants you to do this. And I think when, when Trump lies all the time about everything, it's not that, I'm not sure that he even knows he's lying. I think what he's doing is saying, this is the power of positive thinking. He knows perfectly well that there were not more people at that inaugural than there were at any other inaugural. But if he says it and he thinks positively, maybe it'll turn out that that was true. Or maybe it'll turn out that he actually had done more than anybody else. Or if he says, you know, we're gonna be the, most, the richest country in the world and we're gonna make America great and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. We're gonna make more money, we're gonna have, I'm the biggest, the best, I've got the Trump Tower, I've got the, the most, the best, the heart. That's prosperity gospel. And I think that what's happened is he's now brought all of these people into the White House, the prosperity people. This is what I've seen in the last two years, particularly, and, and the Pentecostals, not as much. But he's brought them into the White House and he has given them a stature and a position that they have never had because they have always been so despised by the evangelicals and looked down on. And now suddenly they're there and they're in the catbird seat. And, um, and, I, and I, you know, in some way, they're looking at this and saying, as Paula White said, God wanted Trump to be president. 
and here we all are, look at us. God did this for us, and therefore God blesses us, and we must be his favorite. And so part of what you're describing is Trump using his personal wealth as part of his inherent appeal, right? That's right. part of, is, is, that, is that part of what he's drawing from the prosperity gospel? Yeah, they love that he's rich. And, 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 you know, and he's appealing to people who are poor, love it even more, and, and, the, and the sort of downtrodden and even the middle class, because they're looking at him and they're saying, well, of course, he pretends that he is a self-made man, but obviously he's not, because he inherited over a million dollars. But they don't care how he made his money, they don't care what he does with his money, if he wants to have gold, you know, Trump um, a sign on the front of the White House, fine. Um, what they are looking at is that they admire him for the fact that he has made all of this money and that he has uh, kept bringing, you know, he's never given up. He's brought himself up to the top. And somehow, if he can do it, he's, it's like the power of positive thinking. He's telling all of them, you can do it too. And the, uh, Kate Bowler, who's uh, at Duke Divinity School and one of the great, uh, religion scholars, prosperity gospel. She said, you know, the bottom line for prosperity gospel is fake it till you make it. And I think that's true. I think Trump fakes it and fakes it and fakes it. Talk about fake news, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, that's where he gets fake news. You, you know, you, if, he, if he says, uh, if he lies, it's fake news, but he's faking it until he makes it. And it, maybe at some point it'll become true. I was thinking of marrying the gospel with the prosperity gospel. Does that make it fake good news? But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> EJ, you know, uh, President Trump during the campaign when asked about evangelical Christians, he said, why do they love me? You'll have to ask them, but they do. So what is the, what is the appeal of Trump? This is a man who has lied about giving to charity who uh, has been divorced twice, who has b bragged and used pretty terrible language to talk about women and sex. W what, is, what is that, how does that mesh with, how does that, uh, explain that paradox to me, if that's explainable. Um, first, I wanna say I'm at a disadvantage on this panel because Sally, those of you who haven't read her book, Finding Magic, Sally, actually successfully puts hexes on people, and she has sworn off doing this, but it always puts a panel member at a disadvantage. So well, I want to I agree. I just say, in my own defense, that I have been asked since my book came out by a thousand people at least, and, and most of them secular, if I would put a hex on Donald Trump, and I have said no, because <laughs> I don't do that again. And but I think that that would be negative thinking, and that's not what I do. <laughs> it's a fascinating <laughs> book. And then Jonathan, I made the mistake of inviting him to speak to my students, and at the next class I said, no professor in his right mind ever invites Jonathan uh, into your class, because you'll never top Jonathan. He was really, Spectacular. I just want to say one thing about prosperity gospel before uh, we move to that. I think it's important that um, the social base of prosperity gospel is at the high end and not just among people who aspire, that the Marble Collegiate Church where Donald Trump went as a kid was a very prosperous group of people and they liked hearing, it's a kind of odd form of Calvinism, uh, they like hearing that their success is a sign of being blessed. Uh, Michael, uh, I, by the way, to proving that uh, the prosperity gospel has put a hex on me, I lost all my notes right before. <laughs> but I did find this from uh, Michael Hamilton, who is a historian of American Christianity. When he went to, into church on Sunday, uh, he wrote, Fred Trump would hear his minister telling him stories about if you have positive thinking, if you're faithful, if you're upholding your family and your community, that what unleashes the power that made you successful. So there's a kind of helpful circularity here that if you are successful, you must be blessed. And then at the other end of the class structure, it's folks who desperately need to be blessed, who have also flocked to the, uh, to the prosperity gospel. It's called the health and wealth gospel. And I was glad Sally mentioned, Kate Bowler is an extraordinary woman. And if you wanna read anything about the Prosperity Gospel, Google Kate Bowler, B-O-W-L-E-R, and New York Times, because she wrote about the paradox or the, the sort of 
tragic irony that while she was doing this work on the prosperity gospelers, she got cancer. And the whole notion is that if you are blessed, you are supposed to be blessed not only with money, but with health. And so there was a real paradox, and as Kate talks about, it's a real challenge to whole congregations when their pastors who are preaching this health and wealth gospel get very sick because it's not supposed to happen. Uh, and what you find is, is, is that um, th this movement finds itself opposed both by very conservative Orthodox Christians who say this makes no sense at all and by social justice uh, Christians who say this is a very strange way to read the gospel. But on Trump with evangelicals, um, I think one of the most interesting findings in the polls on this, uh, there was a poll question early on during the primaries um, where, uh, by PRR, PRRI, where respondents were asked, uh, agree or disagree question, uh, things have gotten so bad in the country that we need somebody who is willing to break the rules if that's what it takes to put things right. Uh, and Trump's strength came among, among evangelicals, initially came among those evangelicals who said, um, we want somebody who's willing to break the rules. Uh, Trump said regularly, when I'm president, you'll be able to say Merry Christmas again. That was a very powerful signal that said, we understand, I understand that you conservative white evangelical Christians have felt marginalized by the larger secular uh, culture, uh, and I'm going to deliver uh, for you. Um, and there's also the simple fact that you know, we talk about white evangelical Christians as some brand new thing that started in 1980. Uh, evangelicalism has been with us for a long time. Evangelicalism lived uh, for a significant uh, time on the left. William Jennings Bryan um, was a fundamentalist who was also in many ways one of the most progressive figures in American life. But there was a big shift uh, in the white South in, the, in 1964 in particular, after LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act and, um, and uh, Barry Goldwater voted against it. And so that there is still racial politics going on here. And I always try to be careful about this because I don't want to assert that all evangelical Christians who are white who vote for Trump or Republican are racist. That's not the point. But there was a backlash vote that this community uh, was part of. And the alt-right over the last couple of years has made a real attempt to sort of, if you will, reach out or colonize parts of the evangelical uh, Christian world. And I think this is a problem for a number of, uh, certainly a problem for African-American evangelicals, but it's also a problem for a significant group of white evangelicals who say this is not what the gospel teaches. Uh, but I think that you just can't leave out that racial politics element. One quick last element of that answer. Um, in the 70s, there was a great controversy because the IRS was trying, was shutting down certain, was challenging the tax status of certain Christian schools in the South. Uh, it was challenging those ta that tax status not because they were Christian schools, but because HEW, um, beginning in the Nixon years, uh, said these are not Christian schools primarily, these are segregation academies. But th they, in the late 1970s and in the Reagan campaign, these two ideas kind of fused, uh, and that it was easier to say, to attack the IRS, for shutting down Christian schools than to say they were shutting down schools that were established to try to avoid segregation. So again, it's a mistake to say this is all about race, but it is also a mistake to leave out the racial component because that's a piece of it. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, uh, Trump, besides um, Paula White, Trump has also had kind of Mark Burns and Daryl Scott as part of his, you know, in informal spiritual cabinet, I guess we'd say, which is a, a, a far cry from, you know, uh, from the more traditional mainline Protestant spiritual leaders who've advised the White House. But I still, I'm still struggling to understand prosperity gospel and how it fits into the American religious story in a sense, and also how, it, how, it, how it's different from evangelical Christianity 
Um, and so I don't know if any of the panelists want to talk about that. And then I'm also trying to figure out how it then has been shaping American politics. What, what, what influence is it exerting? In, in the way we've talked about it today, you know, we've talked about the prosperity gospel is essentially almost like a, a wealth is a validator, and Trump's used that to great effect. But is there more than this than just the simple money message? I, I just want to say one thing about Kate Bowler, who was the, the, the young woman who was the, at Duke Divinity School. She got cancer. She had stage four cancer, and she really had small children, no time to live. And she was ashamed of it. I mean, as so many people who are part of it, but she's not in the prosperity gospel, but that they make you feel ashamed if you're sick because somehow God is not favoring you. But she has been, four weeks ago, she found out that all of her tumors were gone and she is completely cured. Um, and I just thought that was a nice thing to know, but also amazing. Um, but, you know, I, I think that one of the differences between the prosperity gospel and the evangelicals is um, ethics, values, and morals. And I think that all of them, but particularly the Pentecostals and the prosperity gospel people, have become very pragmatic about what it is that they want. And, and you know, you ask... Um, Evangel and, and as EJ said, the evangelicals are not one group of people, just like white people are not one group or black people are not one group. I mean, we have a f Jim Wallace, a friend, who's a very liberal evangelical white Christian. Um, but I think that um, the evangelicals um, do try to meet the needs of the least of these. I mean, the people who are needy, they are much, have much more of a social conscience. And I think that they have become very pragmatic where Trump is concerned and have just kept their mouths shut about all of the atrocious things that he says. I mean, the cruelty, and they know it. I mean, when he's mocking the Gold Star families or mocking the disabled or calling people names and, 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 or uh, assaulting women, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to face it, they don't want to know it. And so they just don't talk about it because that is not what their agenda is. And, um, and so Trump does not, I, I think if you ask them, would you behave this way? Do you teach your children to behave this way? WWJD, what would Jesus do? I think that they all go silent because they can't answer this. But I think that the prosperity people will say, well, Trump is a baby Christian. He's just on his knees crawling. He's just learning how to crawl. So she had, he hasn't, I mean, that's literally what they say. They call him, Paula White calls him a baby Christian because he's only just learning how to be a Christian. So he needs a little work, a little help along the way. Um, and we all do in our own right, way. Right, right, <laughs> yes. But I, I mean, I, I think that that's one of the ways that they look at him. And, um, and, and they also see him as, as somebody who can further their agenda um, which is to, to, uh, to represent the wealth that they want to accumulate themselves. And so if you call it greed, I mean, if you have uh, Cadillacs and private planes and big churches and 5,000 or $5 million organs or whatever you have, um, this is, if you, if you rationalize that this is a good thing and that what he's doing is a good thing, I think that that, um, I think that that, is, is what they're trying to do, and that's what turns the evangelicals off. But they have another agenda, which is the abortion agenda, and that's what keeps them all going. And I, you know, I was saying to uh, Kate Bowler, I said, what he said, I'll walk down Fifth Avenue and I will shoot somebody, and they won't care. They'll still support me. And that's right. That was about his whole base, not just... Uh, that's right. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the thing is, is there, I, so I asked her, is there anything that he could do? Anything, anything, anything that would cut off his base, that would turn his base against them? And she said, if he became pro-choice, that's the only thing that he could do. Um, 
And so the evangelicals being pragmatic will just put aside out of their minds all of the cruelty, all of the bad behavior, all of the lies, all of the unchristian behavior because of that one issue. The prosperity people are looking at it in a very different way, which is they're looking at Trump as, you know, you can look at in, in the Bible and all of these kings who were atrocious and unconscionable behavior, but they were there because they were, um, they were blessed by God and they actually did God's work even though they were horrible and cruel. I just, oh, go ahead, Jonathan. I, go ahead. Okay. Um, when, when I started studying televangelism, right, and I actually think Donald Trump is a master televangelist, right? I really do, right? I mean, he, he knows how to put on a show, right? He knows how to work the cameras, right? Even the, the picture, if you remember when he brought out all the legal documents to demonstrate how he was recusing himself from his business, he put them all across a table, right? And it would very much looked like when there's a televangelist uh, prayer thon going on, how they take all the prayers and put them over the table, right? Um, and then, of course, we saw that many of the sheets were empty, right? Um, but when I started studying televangelists, I, I looked through the, I was looking at it through the lens of British cultural studies, and I discovered that there was three kind, three other examples that I should interrogate to help me understand televangelism. And those three other cultural phenomena were um, soap operas, soap operas, which now would be considered more reality television, soap operas, professional wrestling, and pornography, okay? Why? Soap operas, professional wrestling, and pornography. Those three cultural productions, because in so many ways, they both reflect and project the larger society. And these are all steady, multi-billion dollar secret evils, guilty pleasures, that no one likes to admit, yet clearly by their purchase in American society, right? The purchase that they have on so many people, they resonate at a deep level. And it's really because of the ways that they both project and reflect larger ideological, stereotypical trends that just resonate at a deep level. The same is true for televangelism. Many people do not like to admit that they watch televangelists, right? But obviously, these people and everyone who's watching the, these televangelists are not duped, uneducated people trapped in false consciousness. Right. And so therefore, when we study soap operas, when we study professional wrestling, the archetype characters, right, good versus evil, right, high and low, they're things that make sense to us. And when we think about the character, the archetype of prosperity versus poverty, when we think about the archetype dating back to Horatio Alger dime novels, Right, of who is successful and prosperous in American society. Beginning in the 19th century, the businessman rose to the level of the high priest of American capitalism. And the businessman since the 19th century has continued to have that kind of purchase on America. In 1925, there was an advertising man. Some of you may have heard of him. His name was Bruce Barton. Bruce Barton published a book entitled The Man Nobody Knows. And it was about Jesus. It was about Jesus the businessman. How Jesus took 12 mid-level managers and created an international corporation. Right? Some of you are giggling, but this is literally what the book was about. It's pretty impressive when you think about right? it. Right? <laughs> um, this book outsold F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby that year and stayed on Publishers Weekly's top selling list for 88 weeks. When we talk about Temple University, founded by a Baptist preacher by the name of Herman Russell Conwell, his best known sermon was, was entitled Acres of Diamonds. And it was about a man who searched everywhere for his, he sold his property and he searched everywhere for wealth. 
But the person who bought his property dug down deep and discovered acres of diamonds right below his feet. Anybody who's familiar with other parts of American history, you may hear part of Booker T. Washington's 1895 Cotton States Address in there, right? About people are thirsty, but if they just dip down, they'll find out it's not salt water, but it's fresh water of which they can drink from. And in W.E.B. Du Bois's critique of Booker T. Washington, he called it the gospel of wealth, work, and money that Booker T. Washington is selling to the American people. And Herman Rustin Conwell also was known for saying that it's honesty, the honesty of the American businessman and American enterprise that creates wealth. And I've had the opportunity to meet so many wealthy men across my life, and I will say with all confidence that eight out of 10 of them are honest men. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but do y'all see where I'm going here, right? And so when we start talking about the post-war era, the prosperity gospel that's beginning to develop, it's actually developing as a spiritual Protestant variant of this kind of American religious identity that is developing within otherwise what we call secular culture. And that is why so many prosperity gospels, preachers, they don't call themselves pastors. They say, I'm the chief executive officer of this ministry. Right? That's why they don't identify their evangelical ministries as just that. Many of them say, I'm the head of a transnational corporation that ministers across the globe. And this is catching on in West Africa. It's catching on in South America. Right? And so what we have is the preachers in many cases, the prosperity gospel preachers, trying to be and trying to mimic the Jack Welches and Donald Trumps of the world. And whenever their critique came, such as Grassley, Senator Grassley, when he called the investigation on them in 2007, many of their defense, to the, they defended themselves by saying, it's amazing to us how you critique us for having wealth and prosperity when we're CEOs just like the next businessman, but you don't critique them, right? And so what I'm trying to say here is that to me, Donald Trump is an extension of this culture and it makes perfect sense to me. And it's also why I believe that our critique should go both ways. Because if we're gonna critique televangelists and the prosperity gospel and how people are bringing money to the altar and giving money in hopes that they will then be able to buy a new house or buy a new car, right? Well, I think we should also critique a lot of what we see on HGTV, right? Flip this house, I want that kitchen. Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, MTV, all of these other shows that capture this kind of aspirational identity that is part and parcel of the psyche of American society. But uh, wait, wait, I, I feel the spirit is moving me to defend Pentecostals, evangelicals, and even <laughs> to some degree, God help me, uh, the prosperity gospel. But let me, let me start, I mean, I think what it's- about businessmen? Uh, yeah, no, I'm not gonna go there. Um, the, they, they can defend, they have a lot of people defending them. Um, just on, I mean, we gotta go back and look at the American evangelical tradition, which comes from a very small d democratic spirit. Um, Nathan Hatch, a great scholar, wrote a book called The Democratization of American Christianity, and, and evangelicalism was rooted in the idea that people could read scripture for themselves, they could study for themselves, they could convert on their own. It was a deeply dem small d uh, democratic idea, uh, and a lot of the evangelical religious movements split. There were obviously some southern evangelicals who defended slavery, but a lot of the motive power of the abolitionist movement came out of the evangelical uh, tradition. And so we can't, you know, and we speak of, we're, we're talking almost entirely here about white Americans. I mean, African Americans are, to a very large degree, either formally or informally evangelical in their, uh, you know, in the, they're, they're Baptist or they're independent evangelical, the Church of God in Christ. Well, uh, that's Pentecostal, which I'll get to next. The Pentecostal tradition was the most racially integrated uh, tradition when it started out on Azusa Street uh, in Los Angeles in 1906. Now, it's a sign 
of American racial division that um, uh, there, there was th this integration, this biracial, multiracial movement couldn't remain as a multiracial movement and they split apart. And thus you have the Church of God and Christ, Assemblies of God, they have split along racial lines. But again, the motivation that the spirit was moving and transforming people, this wasn't necessarily a selfish, um, you know, I'm gonna get rich uh, uh, faith. This was about personal transformation. The one thing I wanna say about the prosperity gospelers, um, and uh, Jonathan alluded to it, is there has always been within uh, almost all religious traditions a certain self-help either component or sidecar uh, where conversion would lead to your being a better person, whether it's because it'll help you kick alcohol or whether it makes you rich. So self-help is not unique to the prosperity gospelers, and we often, a lot of Orthodox Christians don't like self-help religion in any of its forms. The prosperity gospel is just a whole lot more explicit about it. <laughs> There's actually uh, another book um, you've referenced, Kate Bowler. Actually, the first academic treatment of the prosperity gospel to come out was by a gentleman by, by the name of a sociologist named Milman Harrison at uh, UC Davis. And this was, he touched on that, that actually in studying this one prosperity gospel word of faith congregation, the ways that it had very much real material impact upon their lives, right? And so, for example, while many of them had bought into the positive confession and bought into the sowing and the tithing, right? Many of, when you talk to them, it's not necessarily that they believed that when they sowed that they would get money back tenfold, right? But it brought an actual a form of fiscal discipline to their household, right? And it's from that fiscal discipline that they began to see certain rewards, right? That they credited to this prosperity gospel, right? And so it's a way of looking, to your point, at the prosperity gospel and its real impact on uh, everyday people where we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater because there's always the self-help component. Or, or the and, baby Christians. Right? And we have, <laughs> we have the world's expert on Methodism, the dean of our divinity school here, who could speak far more learnedly than I about the sort of the parallel tracks where when you looked at Methodist revivals, there was a strong self-help, self-improvement component and there was a strong social justice component that were often uh, intermingled. And it was a movement of the working class that had real political effects. In Britain, it said that the Labour Party owes more to Methodism than to Marx. And so I think it's important for us not to, um, not to condescend to these very broad uh, religious movements that have had complicated and in many cases highly positive uh, impact, even though they have also been abused as all human institutions well, are I, abused. Well, I mean, I think you're right, and I think um, what we're really talking about is the value of capitalism, and 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 you were talking about America and what America stands for, and and the American optimism, and people came here from all over the world because they wanted to prosper, they wanted to do better than they did in their home country, and they wanted to work hard, and they wanted to make a better life for themselves, and they wanted the children to have a better life, and I, I mean, all of that is is who we are. We're and a lot of the prosperity gospel is about individualism. You know, we have to go out, we have to be, do this on our own, we can't be relying on other people. By their fruits, you shall know them. Um, but I think that the prosperity people, the ones that represent the prosperity gospel, have taken it off into a sort of unfortunate turn. And if you look at some of the people who are leaders, like Paula White, for instance, who um, misrepresented herself in terms of her education and also the fact that the church went bankrupt and she denied it and then Burns, you were talking about, who um, lied about his education and his military right. service. And these are the people who are now in the White House right now as Donald Trump's spiritual advisor. So I think this is what I'm talking about in terms of um, ethics and morals and values. That, right, no, that I, the, I, I, our values are that you, know, you, you go out and you work hard, it's the Puritan ethic and all of that but this seems to have veered off into an unfortunate um, direction, I think. 
I just have this habit of moving into the minority when there is an overwhelming majority being formed. And I just thought, I agree with you on that. I mean, I have no, I, f I fundamentally think that uh, prosperity gospel theology is just deeply flawed. But my, my larger point was only that I think we were conflating too many forms of enthusiastic religion together and we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't do such a thing. So uh, we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience in a couple of minutes, but I'm just gonna ask, uh, I wanna ask uh, uh, another, another question, but moderator's privilege. And, and I, I do want to get into... You're blessed, too. You well, know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to get into the, the way this has gone from... Uh, the, the way this has shaped American politics. The way this has affected uh, even public policy. And wanted to ask the panelists, anyone who wants to take it up, uh, other than Trump, where they've seen this prosperity gospel most vividly express. See, I, I'm curious what Jonathan has to say and, and Sally about this. I'm not sure the prosperity gospel all by itself has had an enormous impact on public policy. I think other religious traditions have been more conscious of having that impact. I think the prosperity gospel uh, speaks uh, for a strong strain of individualism as Sally uh, suggested, and a, the focus on self-reliance that Jonathan sort of connected to book, some of Booker T's ideas. And so there is something deeply American about this strain, but I don't think it has a kind of social power the way the social gospel did, the way what you might see as civil rights or black liberation theology did, the way Catholic social teaching did. Um, you know, I don't think it has that power. I think it rather speaks for a strong strain of American individualism that was already there and that it sort of draws on rather than creates. Well, how would you describe the journey between George W. Bush's compassionate conservatism to, to Trump's own particular brand of the prosperity gospel? What's that, what's that trajectory in the... Well, I want to hear from other people. I just want to say one thing. I, we don't know how serious Trump is about any of this, and I think that's yeah. an important thing yeah, to yeah. just put yeah, on the yeah, table yeah, yeah. Uh, I think up the front. the bottom line. And that, um, <laughs> that Trump understood that evangelical, white evangelical Christians were a critical part of the Republican coalition. He also saw that in the primaries, he was losing the most fervent among them, the church going among them, to Ted Cruz. He lost the Iowa caucuses because white evangelical Christians in Iowa went to Ted Cruz, not to uh, Donald Trump. But he understood that to win in the general election, he needed a very big vote in this community and he set out to get it. He made at the debates uh, a far stronger anti-abortion statement than George W. Uh, ever did. I think with George W. Bush, whatever you think of him, and I had kind of complicated views myself at the time on uh, compassionate Christianity, which is a, a compassionate conservatism. I once told my friend Michael Gerson that I didn't fully appreciate the compassionate conservatives until they disappeared almost entirely. <laughs> um, and that, um, you know, I, I had some sympathy for the Bush faith-based initiative up to a point. Um, but I think whatever you say about Bush, and, and I disagree, there were other ways in which I thought that conservatives were using private um, charity as a substitute for programs for social justice. But um, there, this was real for Bush. I, I, there is, I, I did a big piece on Bush back in 1998, and I spent a lot of time in Texas. And even the people who really disliked him politically said that this religious conversion he had and this faith he had was an authentic part of who he was, who he is. Uh, you can't say that with any certainty about Donald Trump, although the one authentic piece is he did go from um, uh, Norman Vincent Peale's church to this. So that is one kind of line through that might speak to something real. But in his case, I just don't think we have any idea, whereas with Bush, I think we did. Well, you, d d Bush uh, did start the faith-based office, right. and which was very pluralistic. 
Right. I mean, there were Muslims and Catholics and Jews and Hindus and Sikhs and everybody else. And, um, and so he reached out to a huge group of people and Obama continued on that. I mean, it was all, but it was all based on social justice and social services, both of those two. This operation at the White House um, is almost all Well, white they've done Christians. virtually nothing about the faith-based office. No, no, they've done nothing about they the faith-based office, but I just want to read you this because Pence is hosting a, a Bible study group in, for cabinet officers in the White House, and it's led by this uh, evangelical pastor named Ralph Drollinger. And here's what he says. Um, he specializes in proselytizing to elected officials. Um, when he wrote, women with children at home who either serve in public office or are employed on the outside pursue a path that contradicts God's revealed design for them. It is a sin. Drollinger describes Catholicism as a false religion, calls homosexuality a sin, and believes that a wife must submit to her husband. This is the guy who is leading the prayer study group in the White House to cabinet officials. And he later said something about they were such a great group because they really learned and listened and learned. So, I, I mean, this is such a totally different, to talk about veering off into another direction from what Bush and Obama tried to do in the White House. Uh, uh, there, so, 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 you know, sometimes well, the first thing, you know, in terms of your question, you know, I think again to your point, we have to be the diff we have to be careful with the dis distinguishing between you know correlation and causation, right? You know, and, and I'm not sure how much you know the prosperity gospel caused any of this as much as as I said earlier, it's somewhat of a reflection, you know, and there's and there's correlation there, um, you know, and there's also another thing that I want to be mindful of, you know, when you hear somebody like uh, Donald Trump, right? All of a sudden you listen to a George W. Bush, and he sounds like Martin Luther King Jr., right? <laughs> uh, and so we, we need to be mindful, right, that we don't give too much credit. And, one of the, and the reason I say that is because even if we, this kind of correlation, I remember in my research and studying these communities, often the prosperity gospel preachers would talk about the danger of government intrusion, right? And how no one can provide social service better than they can because this is their responsibility. And for you individuals, you have to stick to the formula. You have to profess your faith. You have to understand it as a con the Bible as your contract, right? And then you have to sow and reap. Healthcare, the government cannot take care of healthcare. The Bible can take care of healthcare. That's their language that they use, right? And it's this kind of divine sacred presence that can meet every need, right? And there's a certain neoliberal logic there, right? And when we talk about or when we look at the logic of free market fundamentalism and the invisible hand and more importantly, kind of federal devolution as it relates to social service provision. So a lot of what went on in the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives and even compassionate conservatism was pulling the federal government out of, right? And then doling some resources to targeted, very specific faith-based organizations so that they could do it on their own, right? And I do think that that is something that worked, or at least many people in the prosperity gospel community have been in favor of for the past three to four decades. And it's something that we've seen taking shape over the past three to four administrations. You know, what's ironic is that um, John DiUlio, who was head of the office under Bush for six, the first six months, did a study which showed that President Obama actually gave more aid to faith-based organizations than the Bush administration did. And surprise, surprise, that's because, in part, the Democrats, Obama, spent more on social services than the Republican administration did. Um, the second thing is, that, and I, I agree with your point that um, you know, we should not remake George W. as a social democrat or as Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, but there is one important contrast that I think um, is really being felt now, which is uh, nationalism versus conservatism. 
And Gary Gerstel, a really great historian, called Bush's program the multiculturalism of the godly. Um, and that, you know, the idea was that um, Bush welcomed everybody, expected people to live by a certain creed, but this creed was, did not discriminate on the grounds of race. It was not a blood and soil creed, whereas ethno-nationalism is very different from the multiculturalism of the godly, and I think it's one of the reasons why even people who were critical of Bush when he was president have a certain nostalgia now uh, that you are warning us to be to take in sort of uh, as to the right dose. You, you were talking about irony. I mean, and you were talking about irony, but and in terms of the difference between government aid and and the social working charity, social society, and, and the work of the churches, I think the, the great irony recently has been in Houston after the hurricane, where all of these people who were sort of prosperity um, gospel types, suddenly their houses were underwater. And what did they want? They wanted government aid. And right. who did not come to their aid? But Joel Osteen who oh, right. is one of the top prosperity gospel preachers in the country, has one of the top biggest churches in the country, and he did not open his church to anyone until he was criticized for it, and then said, well, nobody asked. I mean, something to that effect. Um, and so I think you have this, <laughs> the, this incredible moment where people say, we'll take care of ourselves, we'll help, you know. Uh, we need money, we need everything from the government. And um, I think they're, they're trying to have it both ways and it doesn't work. So I'm gonna invite you, if you have a question, to stand at the mic and we'll call on you. Uh, just three, three rules here on the forum. The first is introduce yourself. The second is make it a question, not a statement. And three, keep it short and sweet, please. So we'll start here. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Roberto Rodriguez. I am a graduate of the MPB program at the Kennedy School in 1992, and today I have the honor to serve in the uh, admissions committee for the MPB program. Um, I was raised in Cuba with what I would call light Catholicism. I don't identify myself as a religious man, so I'm about to get in trouble. How does prosperity gospel explain the Beatitudes. And as I read essays for young men and women who are trying to enter this program, and they're trying to prove commitment to public service, I think more of the Beatitudes than prosperity gospel. So what should I be looking for from a prosperity gospel candidate in terms of public service commitment. <laughs> Reverend, answer this theological question because it's an excellent one. I, I do not have a clue actually what the prosperity gospelers make of the uh, Beatitudes. This is the last time I sit next to you. No. <laughs> you notice how he keeps I, talking I, about I, I was I'm just trying to hear what. Well. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, take I, it away, boys. I, I, it's all yeah. yours. Um, <laughs> I, I learned the value of delegating things you don't know, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, well, one of the central features of the prosperity gospel is that poverty for many of its preach for the preachers, is a mindset, that's the teaching. It's a poverty mentality, it's an impoverished mentality. And so when one talks about the poor, right, they take very seriously that interpretation of the poor in spirit, right? Um, and, and, and so therefore, they would teach that you can be materially wealthy, but still be impoverished in spirit, right? Um, it just so happens that all, quite often, that critique toward the wealthy doesn't seem to happen quite as often, right? Because um, obviously we haven't seen it in the past uh, two years, either on the <laughs> campaign trail or in this administration. Uh, but it's that poverty of spirit that they, where they put the emphasis. And so therefore they would explain um, away uh, um, the Beatitudes in that way. Um, and they would justify and in some ways, it animates their social service work and social service engagement, because that's another thing I think we should be clear about. Um, 
they are not opposed to community involvement and community engagement, even, even if it does take place largely at this kind of level of community service, right? Social justice, much bigger, broader structural change, not so much, but very much being able to reach and teach the individual because they feel that through their community engagement and community service that they are able to minister to and speak to those who may have an impoverished spirit or an impoverished mindset, or as they often put it, the curse of poverty over them. Yeah. So that's, that's from a theological perspective. That is how they, that is what they profess and how many um, understand and interpret their community service engagement. So can I, I also think they might be more likely to apply to the business school than the Kennedy School. <laughs> uh, and, and I actually think theologically that might be the case. <laughs> and I actually want to follow up. A joint degree programs. The joint degree well, programs. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I want to follow up on that question and ask about um, as Americans leave mainstream Protestantism, for uh, a lot of different, for secularism, for the prosperity gospel, for a wide range of other, um, other kind of faiths. I is there something lost, especially as it relates to public service and the public sphere? Well, there is a way in which um, the old, so it, 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 I'm, it's, I'm gonna use a uh, a, a term that's larger than it should be, but if you will, the old Protestant establishment or the old mainline establishment um, and its language and its commitments for a long time in American history provided a kind of civic glue uh, for uh, the country and that there was a way in which every American, including you know, Muslims and Catholics and Jews and atheists, we were all a little bit Protestant, which is what my friends at the Vatican used to tell me when I covered the Vatican many years ago. But I think there is in this, there was a shared language, a shared set of commitments that came with a kind of a strong Protestant establishment. Now we got rid of that for good reason. We got rid of that, A, it was white, it wasn't, bi uh, it wasn't multiracial, B, it was, in pr it, it excluded Jews, Catholics, Orthodox, all kinds of other, you know, uh, all kinds of other people, and to its credit, it underwrote religious freedom, which allowed those developments to happen over time. Um, but when we, but in losing that civic glue, we, I think we have been struggling for 60 years to try to remix something that might work and. Maybe that effort is hopeless and nostalgic, and we're going to have a need a very different. Maybe we'll we'll need several kinds of glue instead of this one large civic project. But I think a lot of the interest in faith and public life over the last thirty years, uh, and even to some degree the rise of the religious right, came from a sense of some would say nostalgia for that old civic glue. Others. Um, would say it was more legitimate longing than mere nostalgia. But I think that is part of uh, what was lost. And I say that as a Catholic who has no interest in the continuation of the informal establishment of Protestantism, but I think it had this connective quality in the United States. What I've found is that it's splintered. Um, so, you know, we, at one point we were, quote, a Christian country. And so everybody was part of the church, and I mean that was a long time ago, and that doesn't exist anymore. And and we are so much more pluralistic. So I don't think that there's sort of that overall umbrella, um, religious umbrella that we had. And so I find that what I've seen lately is that it's just different groups will get together. So there will be Muslim charities, and there will be Jewish charities, and. I mean, the Jews have this expression, tikkun olam, which is repair the world, and so they do their thing, and, and the, the Hindus do their thing, and, and, and then, you know, the humanists, or the, you know, the, the secular people do their thing, and, the, and they do charity, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite hang together, and I think you're right, EJ, that I think there's something nostalgic about that, that 
we all used to feel as though we were in this one big community where we all were supposed to do good and take care of um, the people who were less fortunate than we were. And I, I don't think that there's that, that glue that we have anymore. Yep. Um, good evening. Firstly, a very big thank you. It's very, very interesting to hear your perspectives. My name is Anne Pratt. I'm part of Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative. And my project is looking at a new leadership paradigm based on the lessons of Nelson Mandela. And one of the questions I have looking at Madiba is spiritual intelligence and is spiritual intelligence. And Madiba always said that religion was a personal relationship between an individual and their higher power. Um, he had an incredible ability not to get involved in different religious discussions in terms of creating a point of separation, but rather he found a way of uniting people across religions. And I was wondering what your thoughts are around the concept of spiritual intelligence and to what extent it is reflected in some of these different religious groupings we've been discussing tonight. I was thinking what a say great... The last, can you say the last line again? What? Um, to what extent spiritual intelligence features in any of these different religious segments that we've been discussing this evening, whether it be the evangelicals, the prosperity culture, etc. Well, I, I, um, I actually knew Nelson Mandela, um, and he was an extraordinarily spiritual person. And just being with him, you felt as though you were in the presence of someone um, who was different from everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I mean, clearly he was. He was, I, I've never met anybody like him before. But um, I think he was, in a way, ahead of his time in terms of religion because he did have this view that we all had a personal relationship with a higher power. And I mean, you go into a church or 3,000 people or a synagogue or a mosque and every single person in that place will have a different relationship with whatever or whoever it is that they are there to pray to or worship or celebrate or to even think about. And, I, and what I find that's happened in the last five or six years but uh, with On Faith is that people now, we've got 25 to 30 percent of the people in this country are now um, what you would call nuns, N-O-N-E-S, which means if you say, what is your religion, they'll say none. But they all are seeking some sort of spirituality. I think there are probably only one or two percent are actual atheists who deny the existence of God. Uh, but all of these people are seeking something spiritual. And, um, you know, and I think that Nelson Mandela was, as I say, ahead of his time because I think he was there. He wasn't, um, he was so pluralistic. He, he basically saw the good in humanity and um, he had a religion of his own. Um, he had his own faith, and he respected people, everyone, no matter what they believed or, or didn't believe. I was thinking when you asked the question that I imagine seeing a fundraising letter for Harvard Divinity School where underneath it just says spiritual intelligence, because oh. it's a fascinating <laughs> uh -huh. concept. And the I, I don't have a lot to say on it, except I, I have sensed over the years that there are some people who hear, if you will, a music of faith that other people don't hear, and I use faith broadly uh, in this case, who understand the uh, struggles and yearnings um, and of others and the ways in which faith and reason work together for some people in a way they don't work uh, for others. And I also think there are inherently pluralistic people. Martin Luther King, I think, was mm -hmm. another one of those who used quite both Old and New Testament, uh, used scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, and also documents from our civic life, you know, the Declaration and the Constitution, um, to create an argument that was entirely rooted in his own tradition on the one hand, but actually could be heard by others as being utterly non-sectarian or not, not tied 
to that tradition. And that's, uh, that's a gift, and I think it was a gift of, a, a, in particular of a particular period of American life that uh, we're trying to recreate again in certain ways, or we should try to recreate again. I was gonna say, I, I mean, seeing you reference Martin Luther King Jr., and Martin Luther King Jr. was an evangelical, yeah. he died an evangelical, right? It was strong, it was a part of a strong progressive evangelical tradition, mm -hmm. uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Coalition, uh, or conference, uh, SCLC, its theme was uh, redeeming the soul of America. So the, even the concept of personal conversion meant a lot for King yeah. on an individual level, but because of the ways that he was rooted in the Hebrew tradition, right? That is what helped him to have this kind of understanding that we are all inextricably linked by a common fabric of humanity and garment of destiny. What affects one of us directly affects all of us indirectly. And in the same way, though Mediba had this, he had the spiritual intelligence because on the one hand, yes, he had this kind of concept of spirituality is between one's self and one's God, right? Um, yet at the same time, he also adhered to this larger f moral framework of Ubuntu, right? You know, that we are all bound up together, right? And if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, we go together, right? And it was that kind of spirituality that I believe uh, that we can attribute both the emotional intelligence of a king or of a Mandela, that their personal piety in no way negated their understanding of a collective good mm. yeah. and responsibility. And just to Not add to divide. that, the, there's Michael Walzer wrote a wonderful book called Exodus and Revolution, and the idea that the Exodus was a liberation story that affected uh, culture for 5,000 years afterward. And at the end of Exodus and Revolution, he has this wonderful one, two, three. You know, point one, wherever you live, it's probably Egypt. Point two, there is a promised land. And point three, the only way to get there is to join together and march. And that's what both of them believed. Hmm. All right, last question. Hi, my name is Kara Street. I'm a PhD candidate in the study of religion in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Um, so you, so you could mount an excellent critique of everything we've <laughs> just said. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my question has to do um, with the prosperity gospel and particularly its use of media. Um, I think it can be said that um, of all of the people that you mentioned tonight, um, the prosperity gospelers um, are very astute at using media to get their message out um, and also to kind of prove um, or to show as evidence um, their, their prosperity, right? And so I'm wondering, particularly in an age of media or in an age of digital media that has become synonymous with an age of Trump, how the lure of the prosperity gospel or how we might think about the prosperity gospel as um, using digital technologies, using social media platforms, and how that may be in line with their use of television media or somehow different. Um, my second question has to do with um, the kind of multicultural congregations um, and particularly the prosperity gospel and race as it um, is seen in congregations like Paula White, like Joel Osteen, who have um, a number of people from a number of different racial and ethnic backgrounds in their congregations. And so how we might um, maneuver or think about or even complicate the idea of this lure of the prosperity gospel in the age of Trump where some of the kind of starch, um, I think you call blood and soil nationalism, that kind of um, pushes towards an idea of, of whiteness, um, kind of gets complicated when you look at the congregations on the ground and they're more multicultural and, and more kind of racially diverse. Thank Are you, you by any chance writing a dissertation on the prosperity gospel? <laughs> Not quite, almost. <laughs> yeah, the, the excellent <laughs> questions, thank you. Very close, very close. I mean, I'll, uh, I'll, my own background is in digital media and in preparing for tonight, I visited all the websites of all the prosperity gospel, um, the big names in it. And, um, and, and then, because I was just trying to understand the space a little bit. And one of the things I noticed is they all used actually really uh, exceptional cutting edge methods that kind of best practice in the digital space for acquisition and, and, and conversion from a commercial perspective, commercial conversion. And, and I was struck by that, and that led me to then try and look at some, what I would think of as more 
mainline Protestant or Catholic or Jewish. Look at some other <laughs> kind of institutional representations online. And there's no doubt that uh, uh, you mentioned Paula White. She was among, uh, sh she had what I'm now going to, I'm now gonna send news organizations to Paula White's website and say, that's how you should do email acquisition right there. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's very clear to me they're, they're at, the, at, the, at, the, at the forefront of that. I, I was kind of curious, earlier you had mentioned this, Jonathan, about you kind of implied that, uh, that, that, that televangelism brought a, perf uh, or that the, the religious tradition brought a performance element to television to create televangelism. Mm -hmm. And I wondered to what did what did what did they what did televangelism take from television? Well, I mean, well, I would say televangelism is the original reality television, yeah. right? I mean, it's the original reality TV, right? I mean, this is how we entered the world of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, right? And before that, how we entered the world of Oral Roberts and, and Kathleen Kuhlman, right? These kind of prominent televangelists because they gave us access to their lives, right? And they gave us access to their resplendent lives, right? Um, and so men um, put themselves, they presented themselves as the men that all men want to be and all the women want, right? Uh, uh, female televangelists and or their spouses, the wives of male televangelists kind of presented their worlds as, um, as this is the world that you can have if you and your husband are faithful. You can be well taken care of and drive a nice car and live in fancy homes. Uh, I know in some way, uh, Kira Street, who is one of our students who asked that question, she's writing about a particular ministry of a couple that presents themselves on social media. And really the emphasis is on their their lifestyle, right? Um, and so it, their ministry is almost like a lifestyle style blog of sort. And if we think about a picture is worth a thousand words, right? We have to understand that televangelists are talking loud when they aren't saying anything at all, right? When they're holding a microphone, the diamond ring on their finger, the Rolex watch on their, on their wrist, the type of suit that they have on, the outfit that Paula White wears, right? Her Versace sunglasses that she makes sure that she is captured in. And so these uh, personalities, they paid attention to Us Weekly, People Magazine, Entertainment Tonight, TMZ, right? Because they made sure to position themselves and position their lives in such a way that they would attract many others, right? And what's happened, right? So that's again, again, it's this kind of relationship in the dominant culture. But what's happened because of the prominence and prevalence of media technologies, Kira, is that it's beginning to shape ministries that otherwise are not interested in pr promoting or preaching the prosperity gospel. Because how can we compete with the new megachurch off exit 12, right? And so therefore we begin copying some of their style even as we're professing that we're rejecting their message. And so no, I'm, I'm not a pr prosperity gospel preacher. I'm never a prosperity gospel preacher. And each Sunday I'm saying, I'm never a prosperity gospel preacher. But each Sunday my clothes get a little bit fancier, right? Each Sunday, right, the set and the backdrop becomes a little bit swankier. And it's having that kind of impact on what we would otherwise call the main lines. And that's why I think that religious faith communities, Protestant communities, have to be very careful because they find themselves following a bait. And if they aren't careful with the tools and technologies that they think that they're just using as a tool, they aren't paying attention to the way that it's actually speaking back to them and it's shaping them in the process. Right? I think we also sometimes forget that religion was technologically hip before we talked about technology or even television, that even in the early days of television, a Fulton J. Sheen, an American bishop, was one of the most popular shows on television in full Roman, you know, the most ornate robes possible. You can't imagine what a kind of uh, a Calvinist Protestant made of this. And yet it was really powerful television. In the 30s, the number of radio 
uh, preachers who develop vast audiences on the radio when evangelicals and you know, it pulled back from politics after the failure of prohibition, they nonetheless built this enormous media presence. So there is a way in which you're right that the medium can become the message, but there's also a sense in which religious groups have always been, I think, among early adopters. Uh, some religious groups have been among the early adopters of technology because what is evangelization but preaching and, in a sense, selling a set of ideas to others? And if I make this final, if I may make this final point, and I think it relates to Donald Trump in some ways and his style, even his rhetorical style, um, television, it's a cooling medium. Right? And so therefore, the more bombastic, like Fulton Sheen, right? the more bombastic, right? the more attractive it seems, right? because it's a cooling medium. And the same way, like radio, nuance does not play well within, the, with, within these technologies. Right? That is one of the reasons that you may remember um, that debate between uh, Barack Obama and John McCain that took place at Rick Warren's church. Rick Warren, who's the- Saddleback. A saddleback, right? The purpose-driven life. You may recall that in that context, uh, McCain wiped the floor with Barack Obama. Why? Because the context was one of such. McCain, when he would ask a question, how do you feel about this? McCain, yes or no? Absolutely. Barack Obama, I, I think that question's above my pay grade. Or we might need to look at this from this perspective, and then possibly that is the kiss of death for a televangelist, right? And it, once again, it ties to soap operas. It ties to professional wrestling. You need to have very clear-cut storylines. Very, you need to have a div clear division between good and evil, black and white, and any shade of gray, right? All of a sudden, you're becoming an intellectual egghead. And if we think that Donald Trump doesn't play into that and play up to that as it relates to his technologies, we're fooling ourselves. I want to thank our panelists for an exceptional evening. And I, I'm just, I'm reminded of Gerard Manley Hopkins, glory be to God for dappled things, and even televangelists. Thank you.